Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm glad we could tempt you from the sun and the warmth outside. Uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Professor Judith Olshovich Schlanger, who's with us tonight. She's, um, she studied Hebrew and Semitic and ancient Near Eastern languages in Paris, uh, and then obtained her PhD in Cambridge in 1995, working under the supervision of Jeffrey Kahn on Karaite marriage documents from the Cairo Geniza. Between 95 and 98, she was a junior research fellow at Somerville College, Oxford, and uh, was guided throughout her career in Hebrew um, paleography and codicology by Colette Sirat in Paris. After Colette Sirat retired in 1999, she was appointed senior researcher in Hebrew paleography, uh, in the Hebrew paleography section of the Institut de Recherche et d'Histoire de Texte. And in 2002, she joined the École Pratique des Autres Études, the Autres Études the, where she's still very part-time. Um, she was elected in 2016 as a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, and um, she has been president of the European Association of Jewish Studies. Her research concerns medieval Hebrew paleography, codicology, legal documents, Cairo Geniza studies, Hebrew book history, Hebrew linguistic tradition, and intellectual contacts between Jews and their non-Jewish neighbors. She knows everything. I can, I can sign a paper to that effect. <laughs> she has numerous publications in these fields. Um, I will just um, highlight the Hebrew and Hebrew Latin documents from medieval England, a diplomatic and paleographical study, simply because a lot of the material is local to us. Um, she's the head of the international project Books Within Books, whose aim is to find, digitize, study, and describe fragments of medieval Hebrew manuscripts reused to strengthen bindings of other books and notarial files, preserved in various libraries and archives across mm -hmm. Europe, Israel, mm -hmm. and in the United States of America. Um, she is also, right now, the president of the Hebrew, well, the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, and we're lucky enough then to have her most of the time here in Oxford. Um, this event is sponsored by the center, but mostly by the Friends of the Bodleian Library. And I do urge any of you who haven't joined yet to please join the Friends. We do need your help. And um, we see here every day the results of the help the friends give to the library. So enough here. We'll now have the pleasure to hear Judith talking about the contents of the book, Go Up to Heaven, for whoever catches that, that quote from the Talmud, Bodleian Fragments from the Cairo Geniza. Welcome, Judith. Thank you. Thank you, Cesar. Um, thank you for all of you to, to come to listen to, to this uh, talk about the fragility of, of Hebrew documents, of the, on the materiality of Hebrew manuscripts. And uh, I'm grateful to you that you braved nice weather, beginning holidays, to come and listen uh, to the Cairo Geniza presentation. Uh, we are going to begin in Cairo. With, uh, I'm going to quote a lot of manuscripts, the Bodleian manuscripts. I'm going to talk about the history of the collection of the Bodleian Library and also the contribution of the Bodleian manuscripts to Jewish history as such, uh, using mostly Bodleian manuscripts in order to show you how important this collection is and at the same time how fragile it is and how lucky we are that we can still use these manuscripts as the main source for reconstructing Jewish history 
in the Middle Ages. So I'm going to begin by a, by a specific document. You have shelf marks uh, and images of the documents. We don't have the original here. A few of the manuscripts that I'm going to talk about will be able to, to see them as well on the second screen. So that's why the screen is divided in two, because we are going to follow both my presentation and the manuscripts. It's going to be very complicated. So if you don't follow and if you don't understand me on, or if you have any questions, please interrupt and ask them. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation. We are now in, in Cairo, in Fustat, the old part of Cairo. Um, in 1013, the year 1013, the letter that you have in front of you was written by Elhanan ben Shemaria, one of the leaders of the community of Babylonians, the Jews who came originally from Iraq or Iran and who settled in, in Egypt probably around the beginning of the 10th century and follow the Babylonian or Iraqi Jewish tradition in the new place of settlement. They have a specific Iraqi congregation in Fustat, in Egypt. Elhanan ben Shemaria was absent for several years in Egypt. He traveled to Syria, to Damascus. When he was absent in 1011, his father, Shemaria ben Elhanan, you know these names are extremely confusing. The son has always the name of the grandfather, so we have several generations of people called exactly the same. But this time we know them quite well because there are dozens of documents from the Cairo Geniza that talk about these specific individuals. So his father, Shemaria ben Elhanan, died in 1011. And that was a very tragic moment in the history of the Fustat Jewish community because, first of all, that was the moment of a plague. Many important individuals whom we know from the fragments died in 1011 specifically. The burial of one of them, um, described in a, in a text that was discovered in the Cairo Geniza, which is called Megillat Mitzrayim, the scroll of Egypt, published by Jacob Mann at the beginning of the 20th century. So this document tells a story uh, of one of the Babylonian Jews, uh, whose name was Ephraim ben Patiel, and this particular, per particular man died in 1011. We don't know whether he died of the plague, probably, because that was the, that, that was the moment as well. And during his funeral, the Jewish convoy was attacked. And this particular moment sparkled persecutions against the Jews, which then spread to the Christian community as well. This was one of the rare moments in the history of the, of the caliphs, Egyptian caliphs, when, um, when the Jewish community and Christian community, the two protected communities, the dimmis, the protected um, non-Muslim uh, inhabitants of, uh, of, of, of the town, were attacked and persecuted, their houses of worship were destroyed. So Elhanan ben Shemaria was absent when all these tragic things were happening. He returned to Fustat two years later and he describes in this letter which has been preserved here, well, which is now preserved here, sorry, he, he describes the desolate state of the community. And among these very sad events that he's talking about, he's talking about writings and scrolls torn into pieces and scattered like seeds, Pentateuch codices cast on the ground. So the symbol of destruction of a community is the destruction of the community's books. It is very important, this moment in Jewish history, it's also important from the point of view of the history of the Geniza as such. A few words, I know that most of you are scholars of Jewish studies, manuscript studies, so I'm not going to talk a lot about what a Geniza is, but maybe there are just a few of you who have never heard about the Cairo Geniza, I doubt it, but maybe. So you know that in, according to Jewish tradition, there is a special importance attached to books which are used in sacred contexts, in liturgy. So a Torah scroll, or any objects which are, which, have, which are in touch with holiness should not be 
destroyed by human intervention. So these kind of writings, holy writings, are protected from profanation since late antiquity uh, by putting them in a designated space, a room in a synagogue, a, 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 a burial ground in a cemetery, a specifically designated box. These documents are supposed to disintegrate in a, in a natural way. Um, this specific place is called the Geniza, from a biblical root, probably of Persian origin, Ganaz, which means to hide or to bury. Um, a Geniza is not a library or an, or, or an archive. It is, it is not supposed to protect the books from destruction. It protects them from profanation by the humans. But the books are supposed to disappear slowly, to disintegrate, to decay. So it is not at all a, a place of conservation of the books. It is a necropolis for the books. It's the place where the books die and disintegrate by natural means, but are protected from human intervention. Such a geniza existed in the synagogue in Cairo. I have just told you about the Babylonian community. The synagogue we are going to talk about, the Ben Ezra synagogue in Fustat, was in fact a synagogue dedicated to the Palestinian congregation in uh, Fustat. However, a previous place of wor worship was destroyed during this persecution of the Caliph Al-Hakim I have just told you about. So it is only after the rebuilding of the synagogue, just after the return of Elhanan ben Shemaria to Fustat, that the Geniza have started to be stored, deposited in this particular place. In the 19th century, there was this idea, and some people, including myself, when I was writing my doctoral dissertation, we thought that we have here this wonderful archaeological find where documents were deposited from the Middle Ages until the 19th century, when scholars, European scholars, arrived to, the, to, to Egypt and said, wow, that's wonderful, there is this Geniza that, that hasn't been touched since, since the Middle Ages. Today we know that it was not the case. The history of the preservation, because of course the Geniza was not to preserve the books, but still it allows the fragments of manuscripts to be with us today. So it did preserve the manuscripts. The history is very complicated. The building was destroyed, rebuilt several times in its history, decayed, was rebuilt again, and the contents of the Geniza were taken out of the, of the chamber, thrown out somewhere, for instance, in a synagogue courtyard, and put there again. So when scholars at the end of the 19th century, especially Solomon Schechter, from Cambridge, we are going to talk a lot about him, came to Egypt and thought that they were entering an ancient chamber, they were actually seeing a room which was five years old <laughs> with the documents that were thrown in again. And today we don't really know where from. It's quite possible that the contents of the Geniza come from different synagogues and also from the cemeteries in Jewish cemeteries in, in Cairo, in Fustat, that were thrown back again to the Geniza. But what is important here, what I would like to stress, is this important of the importance of the books, the role that is attributed to the books as the symbol of a living community, a dead community, it is scattered books. We know as well, we see immediately how fragile this heritage is and how easy it is to lose the manuscripts, how difficult it is to have the manuscripts written 1,000 years ago still preserved until today because of, the, of a very complicated history of the Jewish people, even in the Muslim lands. But we are lucky. The community of Fustat, apparently, when we judge from the preserved manuscripts, was a community of compulsive readers and writers, producers of the manuscripts. I'm going to give you a little bit later the numbers of the fragments that have been preserved. We think today, by a rough estimate, 
that the fragments that we have, there are more than 300,000 fragments scattered in 72 diff different collections across the world, we think that originally they belonged to 40,000 codices, books. Um, 40,000 books produced between roughly 950 and, to, and 1,250 in just one Jewish community, a minority. It was not a majority culture, it was a minority culture. Fustat was an important commercial town and Jewish community was, was, a, was one of the biggest in the Middle East. And the communities in the Middle East were, of course, much larger and much more prominent than the communities in Western Europe. However, for the medieval period, a Jewish community producing 40,000 books in such a short time span means, and this is what is preserved, it's just a fraction of what was really produced, written and studied. So we are really in front of an extremely literate community entirely devoted to the study of the books, just from the numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the quality of the books and also the use of writing as discovered in the Cairo Geniza, at all possible levels of intellectual, but also ordinary daily life. So we are really in front of a very literate community. Here you can see the image of the, of the Ben Ezra synagogue in Fustat as it was refurbished very recently in the 90s of the 20th century, and a picture of uncatalogued and uh, fragments from the Cairo Geniza before the conservation, but already in a modern, in a modern setting. Um, the battlefield of books, this is what Solomon Schechter, to whom we are going to turn very briefly now, this is what Solomon Schechter said in his report on his first visit in the Geniza of the Ben Ezra synagogue in 1897 the battlefield of books, a battle in which the literary productions of many centuries had their share. Because what he saw was not even a stratigraphy, archaeological stratigraphy of books that were thrown in a certain order. He saw a total disorder of books that were taken out, thrown back again, and books which were disturbed all the time by unscrupulous people who took out the most interesting fragments to sell them to Western travelers or scholars. This is what was happening. So the state of the Geniza that Schechter saw was indeed a battlefield. We have him here again in Cambridge when he works on this more than 150,000 fragments that he brought in 1897 from Fustat to Cambridge. We are going to talk about, about the Bodleian collection and until now I'm talking, talking about Solomon Schechter and Cambridge. Indeed, because of the size of the collection, the importance of the discoveries and the role of Solomon Schechter in this discovery, Cambridge will be forever associated with Cairo Geniza. But Solomon Schechter, in a way, is a late history of the Geniza discovery, because in the years prior to 1897, when he traveled to, um, to Fustat in order to loot the manuscripts, that's the word that was used by Flinders Petrie, who traveled on the same boat as Solomon Schechter to loot the manuscripts from Egypt. We are at the end of the 19th century, I'm not teaching you about the Western way of appropriating the, the, the local culture and heritage. However, we are lucky to have these manuscripts in our libraries too and be able to uh, study them. We know that Schechter probably would not be so interested in the Geniza fragments, small fragments of manuscripts, although the Cambridge Library bought some fragments, several dozen fragments, before the big trip of Schechter to Cambridge. But I think that he wouldn't be what he was uh, if it was not for these two wonderful ladies, Agnes Smith-Lewis and Margaret Dun Dunlop Gibson, at the time when women were not part of the university, at least officially, they, too, they are two um, 
Scottish sister Presbyterians, they studied Oriental languages, especially Syriac and Hebrew, in, uh, in Cambridge. They traveled, traveled the world, collected manuscripts, and also were one of the pioneers of photography. So they were very keen on, on all the modern discoveries, and they acquired an important collection of manuscripts, part of which a few years ago was acquired by the Bodleian Library. I think that we have about 800 fragments here. And the other part of the collection was acquired by the Cambridge University Library. I say part and part, but actually, Cesar will correct, correct me, uh, it is a joint acquisition. All of these fragments belong to the Bodleian and all of them belong to the Cambridge University Library. So it was a wonderful joint venture between the two institutions. And I think that Bodleian can be proud of this acquisition because it is really uh, the beginning of the Geniza research. <laughs> yes, indeed, there was a competition between these, these two uh, gentlemen, and we are going to come back to that shortly. Uh, so, the most amazing discovery, maybe not for us today, but certainly for the people of the end of the 19th century, was the discovery of a Hebrew fragment of Ben Sira. I think that maybe we, we have some of the fragments of the book of Ben Sira here. Uh, you all know that the book of Ben Sira was probably originally written in Hebrew. It was translated into Greek. The Greek version was included into the Septuagint, uh, but the Hebrew version was unknown or maybe known only from some quotations in the rabbinic literature. In the Talmud, Sadia Gaon referred as well to the book. However, the Hebrew original as such, the book was not known. Um, the two sisters brought from Egypt a fragment. It's not this fragment. The fragment which was brought from Egypt by uh, Lewis and Gibson is today Oriental in the, in the Cambridge University Library, Oriental, uh, um, I think, Oriental 02, 1102. Uh, so this fragment, the, these two sisters were absolutely amazing Hebrews. They were very good Orientalists. However, they couldn't identify the text. No wonder. It was not known before in its Hebrew original. So they asked their friend Solomon Schechter, and Solomon Schechter told them, wow, it looks like a Hebrew Ben Sira. Uh, it was a, an important discovery for the century when the Orientalism in British universities, but also across Europe, was so much still interested in biblical studies. Discovering a Hebrew original of a biblical book was indeed an important discovery. However, what is the most important is that the discovery of the Hebrew Ben Sira came at, an, at a moment when there was a raging controversy about exactly that, the Hebrew version of Ben Sira. A professor of Arabic here, uh, uh, Samuel David Margoliot, before the discovery just, just very shortly before the discovery of the Hebrew or original, delivered a lecture in Oxford. Where in, in this lecture, he claimed that the passages of Ben Sira, which have been preserved in the Talmud, are not the original version of the book. He also proposed to reconstruct the original Hebrew from the existing translations of the book of Ben Sira. So he discarded and discredited the rabbinic and Jewish transmission of the book of Ben Sira as preserved in the quotations in the Talmud. Who was himself a convert from Judaism to Christianity? The two professors who were still practicing Jews, uh, professors or maybe readers, of, uh, but, but teachers of rabbinic studies in Cambridge and Oxford, Solomon Schechter in Cambridge and Adolf Neubauer in Oxford did not like this idea that Hebrew fragments, that Hebrew passages of Ben Sira cannot be considered as the original genuine form, remnant of the text. Schechter at some point when he finally identified the Hebrew of Ben Sira was proud 
and expressed his pride, saying that finally we, meaning the Jews, can get back our text from the Christians. There is this reappropriation of a, of a Hebrew text. So the discovery of the Ben Sirite was not only we have a part of the, of the Bible in Hebrew, which was not known before, but it comes during a very specific scientific controversy in England and it brings a decisive argument in favor of the existence and transmission throughout the centuries from the antiquity until the Middle Ages of the Hebrew Ben Sira. The discovery of Ben Sira, why is it so important for the Geniza studies? Because it prompted a real Ben Sira fever. Scholars traveled to Egypt, decided to look for other fragments from the book. Six weeks after the publication in 97 of the fragments of Ben Sira, of the first fragment of Ben Sira by Solomon Schechter, Adolf Neubauer here in Oxford discovered several more fragments from precisely the same codex. They were already here in the Bodleian. And this brings us to the Bodleian collection. These fragments have been here, had been here, when Schechter published his fragment of Ben Sira. And just six weeks later, Neubauer had them. So, it is also interesting, I will go back to the travel of the two sisters, again, Louis and Gibson, because I would like to talk about the Bodleian and about the, the Geniza at the same time. And we were talking about this preservation, very difficult preservation of the fragments in the Geniza as such, in the building itself. The two sisters returned to Egypt in 97, when Schechter was already there, so after the discovery of the, of the fragment in, in 96, the Ben Sira fragment, they went back to the synagogue and in one of the publications, which is the publication of the palimpsests of the Syriac or uh, Christian Aramaic text, they described their visit, their second visit to the synagogue. They were ladies, so they did not really, they, they did climb the ladder, but they didn't go into the Geniza, which was at that time in an attic. But they describe a very, very, in a very interesting way, the experience, which tells us how the fragments were treated at the end of the 19th century, and it explains their bad state of preservation. The synagogue is a plain whitewashed building, around three sides of which runs a gallery. At one end, one end of this gallery, a rude ladder with rungs very wide apart gives access to a door in the wall some 14 feet above the floor. So it's a kind of attic small window. Through this door, one of the synagogue servants jumped. And as he alighted in the inner darkness, we, who stood below, heard the crash of ancient vellum beneath his feet. So you see, that's, that's one of the stories. It must have been ha happening daily, people going there and just jumping on these piles of manuscripts. Of course, it did not help the preservation. And indeed, the state of the manuscripts was very bad. You have here another quotation from the same publication describing how the manuscripts looked like, how they were glued together by the glue, they trickle like sticky substance formed out of their own decay. And indeed, both Solomon Schechter and other people talk about the horrible smell of the fragments when they were brought out from the Geniza. But we ca come back to, to the Bodleian and to the hero of the Bodleian Geniza at exactly the, precisely the same time as Solomon Schechter worked in Cambridge. Adolf Neubauer, who was the cataloger, uh, sorry, who was the keeper of the manuscripts in, 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 the, um, in the Bodleian Library, who lectured in rabbinics at the university and who was also the author of the catalogue that we still use, one of the most wonderful accomplished catalogues of, um, of Hebrew manuscripts written at the end of the 19th century, but still uh, extremely useful for research. 
Adolf Neubauer was probably one of the first scholars who was aware of the potential of the, of the search of the, of the Geniza, Genizot. In a report which was written as early as 1876, he wrote, may I be allowed to draw the attention of the university to the treasures which rabbinite synagogues might offer from the numerous Genizot in the East. So he knew about the Genizot. And indeed, 1876, it's so much, it's more than 20 years earlier, well, 20 years uh, before the trip of, um, of Schechter and the big rush for the Geniza, Ben Sira, and so on and so forth. Um, but this is the time when the first, um, first um, uh, travelers acquire fragments, of Gen uh, fragments from the Cairo Geniza without really knowing that these fragments come from the Cairo Geniza. In the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris, we have a small collection of 10 fragments of the Geniza, just 10 fragments. They were brought by a, by, by a man from Switzerland who traveled to Egypt in 1872. So it's one of the earliest Geniza collections, very small, just a few fragments. But Neubauer, among the scholars, was probably the first to be aware, if we don't count Abraham Filkovich, the Karite scholar, archaeologist uh, and collector from, uh, from, uh, from Crimea and from uh, Russia. Uh, so he was among the scholars one of the first. And indeed, he was actually very active in acquiring the fragments for the Bodleian. Here I refer to the wonderful recent work of uh, Rebecca Jefferson, who has dedicated many publications to the history of the Geniza research and Geniza collections. Through the catalogues and also through the archives which are preserved, and in the Bodleian it's wonderful because are, the, we have the archives of the acquisitions, she reconstructs the history of the collection as such. And it is a fascinating reading if you don't know it yet. So I was using her works, especially her most recent articles in jo jo uh, Jewish Quarterly Review, uh, where she explains the his history of the creation of Geniza collections in the Bodleian prior to uh, 1897. So we have the story, I will not have time to introduce all these different stages, but you can see that there are several key personalities thanks to whom the Geniza collection came to being. And for instance, with the Count Riamo Durst, who was a German archaeologist and adventurer and, and, and uh, antiquaire as well, antique dealer, uh, it, was, it was a very active collaboration between him as an archaeologist and Neubauer, who prompted him to um, excavate the manuscripts. The Bodleian Library actually paid for the excava excavations in part and acquired the manuscripts later on. However, Dulst was not really bringing the manuscripts from the Geniza chamber, but rather the manuscripts that were taken out, the fragments that were taken out and thrown in the courtyard of the synagogue and in, um, in heaps around, around, the, uh, around the synagogue. But unfortunately for us today, Neubauer, or maybe fortunately because the collection of the Bodleian is maybe not as large as the collection in Cambridge, however, the manuscripts are really hand-picked. They are of excellent quality, both as far as the text is concerned and when you compare with a small confettis of manuscripts that you found, find in other collections, they are relatively well preserved. So they were handpicked. That's exactly the word, because this is what Neubauer was doing. We know today, again, thanks to the work of Je Rebecca Jefferson, that, that the Count Dulst would send packs, boxes of manuscripts, and then Neubauer would just tell him, oh no, these ones I'm not interested, they are less interesting. He would choose the manuscripts that he wanted, and then the Bodleian would put on sale the manuscripts that Neubauer did not take. And we know today that Elkan Nathan Adler, another scholar and, and um, 
uh, and Traveller acquired some of the manuscripts that Neubauer did not like. And this is the beginning, the origin of the, of the collection of Jewish Theological Seminary today in the United States, in New York. So there were useless fragments that Neubauer did not keep. That's why the collection is smaller, but it's still extremely important. And the Bodleian collection contributes in a very considerable way to different stages of the, of the study of the Geniza material, which contribute to different scientific movements in the history of Jewish studies. First of all, we spoke about the Orientalism and the Bible with the Ben Sira, piecing together Jewish history. That was the second stage. It was mainly with Jacob Mann that scholars realized the importance of these fragments in order to just understand how the Jewish community functioned, who were the leaders of the community, what were the important events that we can find out about in the manuscripts. With Shlomo of Goitain, there is another era of Geniza research, economy and society of the Mediterranean. Economic history was of very little interest until the 50s and 60s of the 19th century. What we are leading through today, I would say, are two major developments in the study of the Geniza fragments. The first one is what I would call, following uh, other scholars, manuscripts and archives turn. What we are interested in today is not only what is written in the manuscripts, but also how they are written, what are the contexts of productions, of production of the manuscript, the paleography, the possibility of putting together different parts of the same manuscript, codicology, the techniques which were used to produce books. And then finally, the digital age, the use of digital humanities and the develop technological developments that allow us to study the manuscripts differently through images online, but also it is um, it is also very important. These kind of developments give us a completely new approach, a new view on the manuscripts and allow us to ask completely different questions. So it's not only the access to manuscripts, it's not only the facility which maybe one day will come, will, will, be, will, will work to compare handwritings, to bring together pieces of the same manuscript um, from different collections, Virtually, this is one of the aims of Friedberg Geniza project, which puts online digital images of all the Geniza fragments across the world, including the Bodleian collection. But this is for us an opportunity to see the manuscripts again in a completely different light. So what I'm going for a few minutes <laughs> that remain, I would like to give you a few examples of the importance of the Geniza findings I will be using mostly the fragments from the, uh, from the Bodleian collection. This is just from the same, from the same codex that the Bodleian. This is a, a fragment which was found, discovered in, um, again in the, Cam in the Cambridge Taylor Schechter Geniza collection. I have brought this fragment exceptionally. All the other examples will be from the Bodleian library because it's very important. It contains marginal annotations here in the corner, which are in Judeo-Persian, in Persian, in, uh, in Hebrew characters. Paleographically speaking, this particular manuscript can be associated with the Babylonian community in Fustat. Babylonian meaning Iran and Iraq as origin of the individuals. So what I am personally interested in, the field that I work on, it's the contribution of the Geniza to the history of the Hebrew book in the Middle Ages. And the history of the book, well, the period we are interested in between the 10th and 11th century, it's probably the period of the most amazing development in the book production. It is related to the development of the Muslim culture of Adab, uh, of the Muslim culture of intellectual refinement. However, there was as well this negative attitude to the books as such, as opposed to the oral transmission 
of knowledge. Uh, physicians were concerned about human health. Uh, Isaac ben Solomon Israeli, uh, one of the greatest medieval physicians um, who lived in Egypt and in Cairo, in his book on fevers, chapter part three, he writes that the persistence in reading books and obstination to grasp their wisdom tires the soul, weakens the mind, and exposes, exposes the vital spirit to, to accidental fever. Mm -hmm. So he just treats the books like any other horrible things, you know, sleepless nights, too much drink, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So people should be careful while, while reading books. Mm -hmm. However, from what we can see in the Cairo Geniza, I told you about the numbers of the books. Um, clearly, the Geniza people, as sometimes we call them, or the Mediterranean society in Egypt, the Jews in Egypt, did not follow this kind of medical advice because we have these large amounts of fragments and, as, as I told you, they can be brought together to more than, well, 40,000 original codices. 95% are books and 5% are documentary writings, which is a lot because it represents several thousands letters and legal documents, uh, which, which are a first-hand source for a Jewish community. We have as well new insights into codicology, book materials, the shapes of the books. The Geniza tells us about not only well-preserved large codices, which were showpieces of, of libraries and collection, but also about very popular books, which were personal copies read in very informal contexts that would not have been preserved in important libraries that had a very short lifespan and were thrown into the Geniza because, as we said, they should be pro protected from profanation. So there is also a way of discarding the books that are no longer in use and at the same time protecting them from being uh, desacralized in a way. There are as well the new insights into paleography and the way the scribes work into the Jewish library, Jewish bookshelf. There are so many new books previously unknown that have been discovered among Geniza uh, fragments, information about specific authors and the genetics of the text. We have, for instance, very important, well-known um, fragments in the handwriting of Maimonides, Moses Maimonides, at the, at the end of the 12th, the very beginning of the 13th century. He died in 1204 and we have some of his autographs here in the Bodleian Library, all across uh, the Geniza collections, we have more than 70 fragments written in Maimonides' hand, and they include his legal, um, legal or uh, uh, responsa um, or letters, but they also include drafts of his own books, including the Guide of the Perplexed, several fragments of which have been preserved, but also of his other books, including medical works, which were written for the members of the, uh, of the royal, of the caliphal court, of the, um, of the members of the family of uh, Saladin, who was the caliph at the time when, Napoli, uh, when uh, Maimonides worked. Uh, so we can follow the way the books were created, the genetics of the text, and you can admire Maimonides' own handwriting. And of course, we have as well a possibility through the Cairo Geniza manuscripts to follow the social and economic realities of the book production. So we have a lot of texts talking about the books. We can reconstruct the book history from the books themselves, but we have also secondary sources, letters or documents, contracts for the scribes who copy books for a certain amount of money we can reconstruct the economics of the books, like this particular um, uh, Bodleian letter, in which a person seeks a support of a rich patron to restore an old codex. The letter is from the 13th century, 
the, the original codex, a Pentateuch, is a, is a codex of the Bible which belongs to the Palestinian synagogue congregation of Fustat. This codex was erased. The letters are no longer visible. The codex needs restoring. What it means restoring? That a scribe has to write again the letters passing on the, on the traces of the original letters. Very difficult task. And indeed, it's very difficult, as we read in this letter, to find a scribe who would like to, to do, to undertake this job. All the scribes who are consulted say, well, it's so much easier to create a new being than to resurrect the dead. That's what the letter says. Finally, they find a scribe who takes a very, very low salary of one dirham per, per page to, uh, to uh, restore this book. We can as well, this is not a Geniza fragment, but since it is Maimonides' uh, handwriting and his signature, I thought that I can bring a Bodleian Huntington manuscript, which is not a Geniza fragment, but which belongs to the same world. This is again something that we have to do, to relate the existing Oriental manuscripts with the Geniza fragments, because in scholarship there are two different worlds people working on the Cairo Geniza and people working on the books. These are not the same people. So it's sometimes very difficult to relate, not in this case, because Maimonides is so well known, then of course the relationship is made, but it is very often difficult to relate these two words. What we have here, it's a, it's, it's a book that was copied. It's a Mishneh Torah copied by a different scribe. However, Maimonides himself read through this book and wrote an inscription, Hugami Sifri. This book was corrected, proofread, from my own book. We have here something extremely important in the development of the Jewish book. Just like in the Arabic culture, we have a way an author tries to control the transmission of his own text. This is very unusual for medieval Jewish tradition, where texts are more open, fluid. We talk today a lot about the fluidity of the text, where, where, where scribes can intervene, change the text according to their own opinion, the models they copy, but also they can intervene in a very conscious way. What is happening here, and the author actually has very little to say about how his work, original work, looks like. What is happening with Maimonides is that we can see that he tries to control how the book will look like. This is a very frequent practice in the Muslim world. It's called the Ijaza. The scribes copy manuscripts. The author has absolutely no influence. However, in order to give a value to the copied book, the author gives a permission for this book to circulate an ijaza. This is what Maimonides did. So it is a new development in, in, a, a, in, a, in Jewish book history, and we can follow it in this world. Uh, what we can follow as well is the growing professionalism. It's the scribes produce the books when someone orders, a rich patron orders a book from them. However, through the documents from the Cairo Geniza, we realize that there is a specific profession of bookmakers, which are called warakun, which Ibn Khaldun associates, as you can see here, with the emergence of a specific urban culture. The Cairo Geniza allows us to follow, uh, to follow the development of this institution of stationaries, people who were related to everything which concerns making the making of the books the copy of the books, but also renting the books for the copy, uh, libraries, borrowing of the books, trade in books, and also trade in paper in, and, and other uh, book materials. We have notebooks of such warakun, stationaries, in the Cairo Geniza. We can follow the activities. Here we have a nice booklet of several pages from the 12th century, which allows us to follow the work of such a person, his daily life. 
we have the slow work of some warakun who were sometimes authors. They wrote books, they wrote commentaries, as well as they copied the commentaries themselves. Here we have a 13th century example from the Bodleian of Joseph Rosh HaSeder, who was himself from Baghdad, from, from, uh, uh, from Iraq. Uh, and we have dozens of fragments of his books across the Cairo Geniza. I'm not going to show you more examples because unfortunately we have no time. I wanted to mention the contribution as well to the shapes of the book. Thanks to the Cairo Geniza, we discover that in addition to the scroll and the codex, a very popular book form in the Middle Ages up to the 13th century was a rotulus, a vertical scroll. It's something that the Geniza shows us. Sometimes we can reconstruct such rotuli from fragments in different collections. And there is as well the importance of the documents, documentary Geniza for the study of Jewish history that I have already mentioned. We won't have time to go through it. And I'm going to stop here, going back to Schechter's quotation of a, of a Talmudic um, uh, quotation. The contents of the book go up to heaven like the soul, indeed. But the body of the book is mortal, it is fragile. And sooner or later, it can disappear without leaving a trace. So we are really lucky that by sheer miracle, this particular Geniza of this particular Jewish community, imagine more Genizot and more Jewish communities, communities has survived throughout the history, throughout the conservation, throughout the study, because we too contribute to, to the decay of the books. Each time we study them, we contribute as well. And this is what this is what happened. So uh, I think that we, I will stop here and just, just to, to say, I know that there are several people from the conservation department of the, of the Bodleian Library. So I would like simply to tell them, thank you for their work on the Geniza fragments and how important this collection and their work is. Thank you very much.